Uh, you know, about this time, uh, every summer, I used to fill in for our, our senior pastor, uh, our former senior pastor, and I remember that uh, it seemed like every time the air conditioner would go out when I'd fill in for him. I mean, I'm not kidding. This happened like six or seven times in a row, and I began to think it was a conspiracy that I would have to preach in the heat, and I think Morton has joined the conspiracy, right? <laughs> but I, I always thought when it was hot and I had to speak, I thought, you know, um, most people who love Jesus around the world don't worship in air conditioning, right? Uh, if it's hot, they worship in the heat, or if it's cold, they worship in the cold, or if it's raining, they worship in the rain. And so, in solidarity with the body of Christ this morning, you know, let's just stay focused and uh, direct our attention to Jesus. So I want you to turn with me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17 is where we'll begin this morning. Very early in my kids' lives, they, um, they started asking really challenging theological questions. Uh, Daddy, who wrote the Bible? And I would say, well, actually, there were many human authors over the course of about 1,500 years, but it wasn't just the human authors that were writing. It was God's Spirit that was, that was speaking through them in their own languages and in their own cultures, and so it was God breathing out through them. That's what we call theopneustos, inspiration of Scripture, and they'd say, Okay, is it true? That is, is the Bible true? And how do you know it's true? And how do you know that the disciples didn't just make all this stuff up? Is the devil real? Is the devil here right now? Is he, is he in the room with us? Is, can he hear what we're talking about? Does he know what I'm thinking? Daddy, why do we worship three gods? Sunday school teacher said that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that, and they're all God. I, I thought we just had one God. How is it? that we worship three. I don't understand this. A few observations for you. Um, one is, kids tend to be really literal, right? And often theology is kind of abstract. But kids are literal, so it's hard sometimes to connect. I remember when I was a kid that uh, Sunday school teachers would tell me that I needed to ask Jesus into my heart. Did any of you hear that? And I remember thinking, how will he fit, right? How's he going to fit in my heart? And, you know, slowly I just began to see him just as small, and he had a little room somewhere in my body and a chair that he would sit on in that room, and I kind of just set that one aside, put away that fundamental, literal understanding. And that's kind of how kids think. At the same time, uh, kids can uh, tolerate a little more ambiguity and mystery than adults. That's why Jesus said, if you're going to come to me, just come like a child. Just trust me. Trust me. You know, in our, in since our, our faith needs to be like that, it needs to be childlike, but not childish, right? We need to be childlike in our trust of God, but not childish. We need to understand deeply who God is. We need to understand the Trinity, what it means. Even though it, it is a mystery at some level, we need to deepen our understanding of the Trinity because that is who God is. God is a Trinitarian God, and Christians, we need to understand that. It's the nature of God. We also need to understand why it's important, right? Not, not just uh, the, the words and the theology and the ideas, but why is it relevant to us? Uh, one book on the Trinity that I think um, personally is probably the best book on the Trinity ever written, it's actually the only book that didn't bore me about the Trinity, it's called Delighting in the Trinity. If you want to read a single book on the nature of God as a Trinitarian God. It's this one. It's by Michael Reeves. And he wrote this in the introduction. He said, what is the Christian life about? Mere behavior or something deeper? Our churches, our marriages, our relationships, our mission are all molded in the deepest way by what we think of God. And God is a Trinitarian God. God is a relational God, and it is the relationships within the Trinity that govern all of our relationships, and all of our lives are lived in the context of relationships. Right? And it is the Trinitarian relationships that should guide all of our relationships, which is how we live our lives. So in a sense, all of life should be informed and influenced by our understanding of the Trinity. So this morning we're going to look at the Trinity, we're going to look at what it is and why it's important. Now personally, I often find it helpful to uh, kind of understand my own faith by looking at the faith of others and, and comparing and contrasting. For much of the world, God is not one, God is many. Right? Over, over a billion people are polytheistic 
in their faith. God's not one, God is many. Hinduism is a good illustration of this. There are 300 million gods in Hinduism. I don't even know if they all know one another, right? 300 million gods. And even the ones that do know one another, you know, they don't always get along. There's a lot of conflict. There is chaos in this pantheon of gods. Their purposes are not always aligned. Their personalities certainly are not aligned. And that's a problem in polytheism. Because, you know, in my way of thinking, if, if these gods are somehow influencing the course of human history, if these gods are influencing my life in particular, I would like to know that there's a point. I'd like to know that they're, they're together and they're unified and they're moving toward a good aim. But you can't find that in polytheism. Over another billion people say God is one and God is only one. They are strictly monotheistic. Islam is the largest illustration of a religion that is strictly monotheistic. God is one. God is only one. In the Quran it says, He is Allah, the one and only. Allah, eternal, absolute. He begets not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. This solves the problem of, of in a sense, disunity and chaos in the Godhead, right? Because there's just one God. But it presents another problem, that is, how do we know that this God loves us? I want you to think about this for a moment. Before Allah, in Islam, created, what was Allah doing? Well, he was alone, right? I mean, he was perfectly alone. There was no one, and there was nothing other than Allah. So, did Allah know how to love? Well, no, he couldn't, because love is outward, right? Love is for the other. And so Allah had existed for all of eternity completely alone. He had to create in order to learn how to love. It's not fundamental to his nature. Uh, we are Trinitarian. We believe that God is one and God is three. So we've solved the problem of disunity in the Godhead because God is one, but God is also three, meaning God is fundamentally relational. That is the nature of God himself. What was our God doing before creation? Well, if you're at John chapter 17, look in verse 24 with me. John chapter 17, verse 24. Jesus speaks and he says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. What was our God doing before he created anything? Was he, was he lonely? Was he bored? No. He was enjoying the relationships that existed between Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father was delighting in the Son, and the Son was delighting in the Father. And the Father was delighting in the Spirit, and the Spirit was delighting in the Father. And the Spirit was delighting in the Son, and the Son was delighting in the Spirit. They were enjoying one another. They weren't lonely. They weren't bore, bored. They were loving. For all of eternity, God was loving. That's the fundamental nature of a Trinitarian God. So what does it mean to be Trinitarian? Well, not surprisingly, three things, right? Three things. It means there is only one God. The one and only God is three persons. And the three persons, therefore, are one God. Now, if you're a good student of Scripture, you know, you get out your one-year Bible each year, and you begin Genesis, and you work your way through, and three years later, you've finished your one-year Bible, right? You've gone from Genesis to Revelation, and as you're reading, maybe you discovered that the word Trinity is never used in the Bible. In fact, the idea is everywhere in the Bible, but it was a church father named Tertullian who finally reached out and he grabbed this Latin word Trinitas to describe what he saw clearly throughout Scripture, which was that there is only one God. The one and only God is three persons, and these three persons are, in fact, one. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to unpack each of these points. First, there is only one God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is what's called the great Shema of Israel. Uh, Shema comes from that first word here. It means listen. Israel, listen up because this is the central tenet of our faith. God is one. Judaism was the first monotheistic religion to ever appear in the world. 
God is one. And you see it throughout the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 45, there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Couldn't be more clear, could it? And Jesus affirmed this as well when he was asked, what is the first and great commandment? Remember what he said? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus affirmed that God is one. One And all of his apostles who wrote scripture after affirmed that as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is an illustration. Paul wrote, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. God is one. The one and only God is also three persons. Meaning, uh, the Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Father. And the Father is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father, and the Spirit is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit. They are three distinct persons, right? Not one person, but three persons. Now, this idea, I think, was first really kind of hinted at in the book of Genesis, where God said, let us make man in our image. And a lot of explanations that are non-Trinitarian have been offered for that. Well, maybe God is speaking in the midst of uh, kind of the heavenly assembly Right? And he's, he's gathering in, all the angels are there, and he's saying, let us make man in our image. The only problem with that is we're not made in the image of angels, are we? So I think that's a hint early on of the Trinity. Let us make man in our image. There's another hint in the Old Testament, Psalm chapter 45. And I want you to listen really carefully to these words. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. See what's going on here? Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. God has anointed you. That is, God anoints God. Well, for us as Trinitarians, we have no problem with this whatsoever. right? That is, God the Father has anointed God the Son to be ruler over all of creation. But for Jews, they wrestled and wrestled to try and understand, is this just bad grammar? Did somebody copy this wrong? No, this is a hint of Trinitarian theology. So, God the Father, he is God. God the Son, he is God. God the Spirit, he is God. They are three distinct persons. I want you to read with me. In John chapter 20, verse 17. John chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, speaking to Mary. Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I send to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying is, what he's saying is, the Father is God. But the Son is also God. John chapter 20, verse 28. Thomas fell down before him, and he answered, and he said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. He fell down on his knees, and he worshiped Jesus, and he said, you are my God. And you know, throughout the Bible, if somebody falls down before something other than God, that's bad news, right? Something bad is going to happen. Uh, in John's book, in Revelation, he falls down before an angel, and the angel says, whoa, 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 get up, people are watching, right? You don't fall down before anyone other than God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. He is the Spirit of God or the Spirit from God. Acts chapter 5, we learn that to lie to the Spirit is the same as lying to God because the Spirit is God. And then there are a few occasions we see uh, in the Bible where Father, Son, and Spirit all show up at the same place at the same time. Jesus' baptism is an illustration of this, right? Jesus himself is in the water. The Father speaks down out of heaven, and then the Spirit descends as a dove. Three persons, co-equal with, co-eternally, God. Third, the three persons are therefore one God. Great Commission, John chapter 28, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is either bad grammar again or it's Trinitarianism. One name, 
three persons. Okay? Jesus has baptized them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. That is, they share a name. They share uh, attributes and personality and purpose. They are one, one God. Now, our mission statement says, um, raising up next generation leaders to reach our world for Christ. Right? That's just kind of our slogan to restate the Great Commission, because we want to be a Great Commission church. What do we want to do? We want to make disciples of all nations. What kind of disciples do we want to make? We want to make strictly Trinitarian disciples. To be Christian is to be Trinitarian, so we want people to go out and to worship Father, Son, and Spirit, and to share Father, Son, and Spirit, and to share a Trinitarian concept of God, which is unique among all of the religions of the world, a God who can be one that is unified and personality, and purpose, and will, but a plurality who is fundamentally relational, a God who is love. So how do you explain this, right? How would, how would you, how do you explain it to your kids? Uh, I just discovered as I was walking in this morning that um, if you have kids in children's ministry, you know what they're going to talk about this morning? The Trinity, All right, the Trinity. So lunch conversation uh, you should ask the question first. <laughs> ask your kids first how to explain the Trinity because uh, they might do better at explaining it, right? So how do you explain it? You know, the church has always wrestled and struggled to explain this doctrine. Early 4th century, late 4th century, uh, church father Gregory of Nazanius wrote this. He said, trying to help the church understand the Trinity, he said, when I speak of God, you must be illuminated at once by one flash of light and by three. Three in individualities or hypostases or persons, but one in respect of the substance, that is, the Godhead, for they are divided without a division. As, if I may say so, they are united in division. And we say to ourselves, gosh, Gregory, thanks. Right? I mean, you know, theologians are so good at helping us. So let's just get it down to the basics. What do, what do you mean by the Trinity? I'm more confused now, Gregory. And so the church has come up with analogies. The Trinity is like, it's like an egg. Right? Have you heard that before? The Trinity is like an egg. It's one egg, but it's a shell, and it's a white, and it's a yolk. Mm. But the shell and the white and the yolk are really different by nature. You know, ah, that just doesn't really work for me. So the Trinity, it's like a shamrock. Right? It's actually one leaf, but then there are three leaves that come off of the shamrock. If you're, but if you're lucky, you get four. But never, okay, you can't press the analogy too far, right? Uh, the, the Trinity is like water. Right? Water can exist in three different forms. You've got a solid, and you've got liquid, and you've got gas. And the solid, it's cold and hard with sharp edges. That's like the Father. Well, never mind, okay? But you get the idea. There's, there's something solid, and then you melt it, heat it up a little bit, and then you have the liquid, which is like the sun, and then heat it up further, and there's a vapor. Well, that's, that's even more like the Spirit, right? But when the ice is gone, you have liquid. The ice isn't there any longer. And I, you know, I know you physics people don't talk to me about triple point and the right pressure and temperature and all that. What I'm saying is, in normal circumstances, when the ice is gone, right, and you have the water, you don't have vapor yet. And that's uh, early church heresy. It's called modalism. There's one God, and he just shows up in three different forms. Sometimes he shows up as a father. Sometimes he shows up as a son. Sometimes he shows up as a spirit. But that's not the nature of God. And really, the problem with all these analogies is they're not personal. They're not personal. But God is personal. God is relational. That's fundamental to the nature of God. So God actually gave us two analogies to help us understand who he is. It's marriage and the church. Okay, two analogies, marriage and the church. Genesis chapter 2, it says this. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, the word for one in Genesis 2 is the same word for one in Deuteronomy chapter 6. God is one God. Husband and wife, you are one flesh. In other words, God isn't saying in Deuteronomy 6, I am a mathematical singularity. Because in marriage, you don't have a mathematical singularity. You actually have two persons, right? But they become one. You have husband and wife. You have male and female. Plurality of persons. Personal equality. Males are made in the image of God. Females are made in the image of God. Men are not more in the image of God than women are in the image of God, nor are women more in the image of God than men are in the image of God. Both are in the image of God. That is, 
both equal in their personal nature before God. So plurality of persons, right? personal equality, but differentiation of roles. Men are not women and women are not men, and they're different. They have different functions even in marriage. So God creates Adam first, and he takes from his side a rib, and he fashions this woman to come alongside him and be his helper and to be very different from him. And if you're married, you say, hey, man, we're different. We are not the same. Plurality of persons, personal equality, but functional differentiation, even a hierarchy within marriage itself. Well, that's the Trinity, right? This is what Trinity's like. Plurality of persons. You have Father, Son, and Spirit. They're not all the same. Personally equal. One is not more God than the other. They are all equally God, and they're all eternally God. So personal equality, but you have functional hierarchy. You have differentiation of roles. The Father sends the Son The Son does the will of the Father. Then the Father and the Son send the Spirit. The Spirit glorifies the Son so that the Son can glorify the Father, right? A differentiation in their functions. Marriage is designed to reflect that. The second analogy we're given is the church. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. You see it again? You've got one, but you've got many. Okay, one body, there's a unification, but there's a plurality of members. Right? We're, not, we're not all one person. We're multiple people, but we're all one in Christ, and we have personal equality before God. Paul would say, in Christ, there is neither male nor female, Jew, barbarian, slave, or free. That is, there's no distinction made among you based upon your gender or your race or your social status, but you are different. And you have different roles in the body. Some are apostles, some are prophets, some are teachers, some have gifts of hospitality and helps and service. You all have different roles. And then within the church, he has placed elders, and we all submit to the authority of the elders. That is, we've got plurality of persons, equality of personhood, but differentiation of roles and responsibilities. But we are one. We are one. And these analogies work a little better for us because God is relational, and these are relational analogies. And so God has revealed himself in relational terms. He has revealed himself first as a loving father. God is a loving father. 1 John chapter 4, John wrote, God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Notice he doesn't say uh, just God is loving, right? Because that can be said of me. I am loving, and then, you know, sometimes my kids say, and then dad's not loving, right? I mean, sometimes I'm loving, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm in my groove, and sometimes I'm not. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say God is loving. It says God is love, meaning all the time, every time, when God is acting, God is acting out of love because this is who God is, right? God is love, The word for love here that John employs is actually a word uh, that's hardly ever found outside of the New Testament, before the New Testament was written. It's found subsequently uh, after the New Testament is written, but before in classical Greek literature, you don't find the word agape. New Testament writers grabbed this very rare word and they infused meaning into it. I would define it like this. Agape means to delight in without the expectation or demand of reward. Let me say that to you again. It means to delight in without the expectation or the demand of reward. Right? That is, love is outgoing by nature. Love flows out from God because it's who God is. It's not based upon the recipient. It's not based upon even the recipient's response. It is, in that sense, an unconditional act to bless. It's not merely sentimental. That's the fundamental nature of God. God is always outgoing, right? God is always giving. He can't help but be that way. We had some good friends um, who had a a baby just about two weeks ago, David and uh, Sarah D'Souza. Uh, Luciana Grace is their baby. And when Luciana Grace uh, came into the world two weeks ago, do you know what David and uh, Sarah felt? They fell in love, right? I mean, just, just like that. For those of you who had children, you know what I'm talking about. 
Those of you who haven't, pray that someday you will, or you may have grandkids, or you may adopt nieces and nephews, and you will know that moment where you just can't help but love. You just, you love. It's a person, in a sense, you've never even met before, and immediately your heart says, I love, I just love. There's, there's, a, there's a feeling that's just exploding out of you that you want to give and you want to provide, and, and you do, and you give and you give and you give. And I ask you, when that child comes into the world, what does that child bring to the family? Nothing. Child brings nothing. Child comes and takes, right? It's just a taker. It takes your, takes your sleep away from you, takes your money away from you, right? You just you pour food into the mouth, and then, and then it gets spit up all over the room. I mean, they're just taker. They're takers. And in spite of all this taking, taking, taking that they do, what do you want to do? You want to love. You can't help but love. You can't stop yourself from loving. Do you know that right now in this very moment, that is how God feels toward you? Even if you're a horrible taker, God loves you. Do you know why? Because God is love. God is love. It's, it's not about you and it's not about your response. God can't help but love you. Can you imagine? God can't help but love you. That's how he feels about you this very moment because God is love. And what that means is Creation was an act of love. Right? Creation wasn't simply like an act of power where God, Father, Son, and Spirit are sitting together and they said, you know, we need to make some beings who can appreciate how really strong we are. So we're going to make them and we're going to show off our power so that, in a sense, worship, the fundamental idea of worship would be uh, just submission and awe and wonder at the power of God and maybe fear. No, God didn't create because he wanted just to show off power. God didn't create because he was lonely or bored. He was enjoying perfection of relationship for all of eternity. And we might argue that our entrance into that relationship actually kind of messed things up a little bit, right? God didn't create because he wanted to show off his power. He didn't create because he was lonely or bored. He created because he wanted to demonstrate his love. He he had to create these objects to share in his love. Redemption is an act of of love. Why did God redeem? Because God is love. 1 John chapter 4. Earlier in the chapter, John wrote, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Notice again, in this is love. Not that we chased after God, not not that we were so loving and we wanted to go enter into this relationship with God. This is love that God initiated with us, and he sent his son to be the, the propitiation, meaning the satisfaction of God's wrath against our sins. Because God is love, but God is also holy. And a holy God cannot look upon love, so he cannot look upon sin, so he had to deal with that sin as a barrier. He sent his son to be the satisfaction, the payment for our sin to remove wrath and anger and punishment towards sin so that he could pour out his love upon us. That is why he initiated redemption with us because God is love. Hey, Paul repeats this theme as well in Romans chapter 5. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Again, not based upon who we are. In fact, we were enemies, we're told. We were sinners. We were rejecting God. We were running from God. And God said, these are the kind of people that I love. Because God is love. John 3.16. For God loved the world this much. He so loved the world. And in John's theology, the world includes all people, even those who hate God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Men and women, this is the beauty of the gospel, right? In spite of your response, in spite of your behavior, in spite of your character, in spite of anything that you may have done in the past, God's disposition toward you is singular and it is love. And he's demonstrated his love by giving his son Jesus Christ to die for your sins. Not to die for his own sins, but to die for your sins. And John tells us, enter into that relationship by believing. Just believe. 
Just say, God, thank you. I accept your love. When a child comes into the world, what's that child's job? Well, no job, right? Their job is just to, re- to receive. Receive the love. And that's what it means to, be- to believe. Receive God's love for you. God is a loving father. God is also a sacrificing son. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, He, the Son, is the radiance of His glory. That is, the radiance of the Father's glory. He is the exact representation of His nature. That is, we have three distinct persons, but all are equally God. Right? God the Father is fully and eternally God. God the Son is fully and eternally God. God the Spirit is fully and eternally God. But they are three distinct persons, and so they have different roles and different responsibilities. What is the role of the Son? John chapter 6, Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus says, this is my job, to do what the Father tells me to do. What did the Father tell him to do? Mark chapter 10. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And I have to ask myself every time I read that, why would Jesus do it? Why wouldn't he say, I want a better job, right? Why why must I be the one, right, the eternal Son of God, enjoying fully relationship with the Spirit and the Father? Why would I be the one who has to take on human flesh and live in the heat and walk in the dust and sleep outside under stars or rain? And get beaten and scourged and have a thorn stuck on my head. Nails driven through my wrists and my feet and died. And experienced some rupture and separation from Father and Spirit as it seems that the Father turns his back on me. Why, why is that my role? Why did Jesus, in a sense, say yes? John chapter 14, Jesus said, So that the world may know that I love the Father, I do as, exactly as the Father has commanded me. In other words, why did Jesus take on his role? Because he loves you and me? Yes. But even more so, because he loves his father. And he wants his father's approval. More than anything. So the world may know that I love the father. And that the father's will is more important to me than anything else in my eternal existence. I do just what the father tells me to do. John chapter 1. This is his role. But as many as received him... To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. That is, the son's job is to reconcile us back to the father so that we can be sons and daughters because God wants a bigger family. Or if I can put it in other terms, you were made, you are created, and you were redeemed to receive God's love and to share God's love. You were created and you were redeemed to be one who enters into and shares and experiences the love of God. That's why God made you. And so I ask you, when are you most satisfied and fulfilled? When are you most satisfied and fulfilled? I would argue it's when you're loving. Because you're made in the image of God and you were made to love. It's a paradox. But you're more blessed when you give than when you receive. When are you most miserable? Again, paradoxically, when when you're taking, when you're thinking about yourself. In other words, when you are completely focused on what you need and what you should have and what you need to get, and you're taking and you're taking and you're taking, and you're saying to yourself, if I can just fill myself up. And so you're reaching out and you're grasping and you're grasping and you're grasping. You know what? That's when you're absolutely most miserable. And when are you most fulfilled? Again, paradoxically, when you're giving and you're giving and you're giving because it's at that point when love is flowing out of you that the love of God is flowing into you and you're experiencing it more fully. So Jesus, again, when he was asked, what is the first and great commandment? He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But there's a second that's just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because this is what you were made for. To receive love and to give love. You know, the, the summer after my freshman year at a and I worked at Pine Cove. And I was a counselor there, and I had signed up to work with older kids. I was really fired up to work with the older kids, but I got stuck with the little kids. I was like, ah, I wasn't even sure. I thought, well, maybe I just want to turn this down. So I'm working with, you know, I think it was like kindergarten through sixth graders. And I'm like, that's not really my deal. 
I'd rather be with the bigger kids and doing sports and stuff with them. But I eventually gave in and said, okay, I'll go. And you know, man, I just fell in love with little kids. I had, I had such a great summer. I had a you know, cabin of second graders and then fourth graders and then third graders. And I just, I loved being with these little kids. I loved when the, you know, the light would go on and they would understand the gospel. Or they'd begin to understand how they, at their age, could have a relationship with God and walk with him. I just, I loved it. I fell in love with that age. And I remember after about three weeks, I was put on work crew. And I just, I had a moment. I was down on my hands and my knees uh, in the bathroom with the other uh, counselors who were on work crew. And we were, I was scrubbing toilets, right? I was scrubbing toilets. And, you know, third graders still don't know how to use the toilet, right? And so, I mean, it's just like nasty, nasty. I'm down on my hands and my knees and I'm scrubbing this toilet, and I had this moment of pure joy. I do not exaggerate. I had just this moment of pure joy being with these counselors that I was just, I was enjoying so much and loving them and thinking about serving these kids, and just this little act could help them enjoy their experience at camp and sense the love of Jesus Christ. And I had this moment of just pure delight in scrubbing these toilets for Jesus and these kids. I, it didn't last, right? I don't enjoy scrubbing my toilets right now. Don't call me, hey, Brian, come on over and love me, right? That's not, I'm not, I'm not offering that. Uh, you know, I don't even like scrubbing my own toilets now. I'm just saying in that moment, in that moment, I had this experience that, you know, I'm, I'm loving, loving, and I'm, I'm fulfilled because I'm giving. Okay? That's how we were made. Because God the Father is a loving Father, God the Son is a sacrificing Son. God the Spirit is a serving Spirit. The Father is fully God. The Son is fully God. The Spirit is fully God. They are three distinct persons, and they are co-equal and co-eternal. And so when you see Father, Son, and Spirit, none of them are grasping. They're always giving. The Spirit isn't, isn't grasping for honor and glory. The Spirit is giving. The Spirit is honoring the Son so that the Son can honor the Father. They are, in other words, always in cohesion and cooperation and unity in their personality and in their purpose. It's seen most beautifully in salvation, which is a work of Father, Son, and Spirit, right? It's not just the Son who saved us, but it's Father, Son, and Spirit cooperating together. Titus chapter 3 illustrates this. It says, He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds, that is the Father. Okay, the Father saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. It's not about us, but according to who He is, according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. This is how God saved us. Based upon His mercy, He regenerates us through the Spirit. The Spirit that He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. In other words, the work of the regeneration of the Spirit didn't actually happen in our lives until Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead and received authority from the Father to send the Spirit to regenerate our hearts in the name of Jesus Christ and based upon the work of Jesus Christ because this is the will of the Father. If I can say it differently, salvation is not just get out of hell. Salvation isn't just escape hell. Salvation is not... uh, Manage sin a little better in your life. Stop sinning so much and be a little bit better person. That's that's not salvation. Salvation is not that you would be uh, physically healthy and wealthy all of your life. That's not salvation. What salvation is, is it's, it's entering fully into the relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit that they enjoyed for all of eternity and created you for. Read with me again in John chapter 17. In verse 22, John 17, verse 22, the glory which you have given me, and this is Jesus again praying to his heavenly Father, our Father, the glory which you have given me I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them and you and me, so that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, you love them just like you love me, and I want them to be one and to enter into our unity together. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory 
which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. What is salvation? By believing in Jesus, we enter into this eternal relationship of perfect love between Father, Son, and Spirit. And then it transforms all of our relationships. And it transforms the things that we love. It changes us. In quoting to you from uh, Michael Reeves, he wrote, The Father, Son, and Spirit love and enjoy each other. And created in their image, we were made to love and enjoy them. Blindly and foolishly, though, we have all turned to love and enjoy other things, things that in reality are completely unable to satisfy. But the Spirit's first work is to set, aside, is to set our desires in order, to open our eyes and give us the Father's own relish for the Son and the Son's own enjoyment of the Father. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying the reason why sin is such a bad idea is because it inhibits our capacity to be who we were made to be and to enjoy the relationships between Father, Son, and Spirit. And the relationships that we enjoy with one another, because we're all united in our relationship with God. Okay. So how do we apply this? Uh, let me give you an idea. Uh, as, as we're doing application, if I can, ask the servers to go back and get prepared to service communion. Now, this week, I want to challenge you to memorize uh, two verses. First John 3, verses 1 through 2, and you look at this, you go, oh my gosh, that's just... It's like way too many words, but, you know, it just looks like it because the font's big, right? It's only two verses. You can do this. Okay, two verses this week. I want you to memorize these, and I want you to meditate upon them. John wrote, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. How great is it that we would be called children of God, sons and daughters, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God right now. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be, but we know that when he, when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. Again, what's the, what's the child's job? Child's born, comes into the family, his job is, her job is, enjoy the love. So my challenge for you this week, I want you to memorize this, I want you to meditate upon it, maybe use this as your quiet time this week, and think about how much God loves you. Second application, you were made to receive and enjoy God's love. You were made to share God's love. This is, this is why we do evangelism, because we're so deeply loved. And I want to challenge you this summer. You know, pick one or two or maybe three people, right? So we're talking about training. Pick three people that you know need to know Jesus and experience this love. I want you to begin to pray for them. I want you to begin to initiate with them. I want you to begin to pursue that relationship and pray that God allows you a moment, an opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ with them. Okay. The men would please come forward and serve us as they're, as they're serving us. I'd like to take just a few, mo few moments and just bow your head quietly and begin to meditate upon the depth of the love of Jesus Christ for you that he would be willing to sacrifice so much to give himself for you as illustrated in the bread and, and the wine. Father, we're grateful to you this morning for the opportunity to study your word. We are thankful for you. We are grateful for your son, Jesus Christ, and for the spirit who indwells those who trust in you and fills us and gives us the power to do your will. We thank you for the opportunity to hear about who you are, and I pray that as we move into our week, we would do just as uh, your word challenges us to do this morning to enjoy your love and then to proclaim your love to those around us. Father, I pray make us faithful ambassadors of the good news of Jesus Christ that in the love of God we now can have eternal life because of his death and resurrection on our behalf. We thank you for this time and we pray all of this in the precious name of Jesus, your son. Amen.